So welcome to this fourth webinar um, for the Just for All uh, project. This is a, an EU-funded project, and it is um, <clears throat> uh, about building uh, and acting for the Just Transition. Today's webinar is based on community learning and grassroots initiatives. Um, and the idea is that this webinar will form part of the Just for All MOOC, which is an online course hosted at learning.ea.org, uh, uh, which my colleague Marina will paste in the chat uh, for everyone to, to have a look at. And the course aims to provide a comprehensive understanding of the Just Transition within the context of adult learning and education. This uh, MOOC it consists of eight different modules covering various aspects. This is important to note because we try to dive into as much depth as we can in every module, but of course there's so much to cover and we really wanted to provide a broad overview um, of each topic and there, there is many different aspects that we'll uh, share with you um, uh, in, the, in just a moment. So each module takes approximately two weeks uh, to run through. And that what this means is not that there's necessarily two weeks worth of content, um, but that there will be a webinar to watch. So this webinar, uh, in addition to different lectures and case studies and resources um, and different kinds of discussions. And so we sort of estimated that by the time that you've gone through all of that, that it should take um, around uh, uh, it should take around two weeks to answer. At the end of each module, you'll be able to open a, a badge. And if you complete the entire course, you can receive a certificate. So that means not only watching the webinar, but also taking part in different um, activities. And if I click on. Um, so we're on the fourth module, as I said, on grassroots initiatives and community learning. We've already done three different webinars and therefore different uh, modules which are available. First is an introduction to lifelong learning and uh, adult education for the just transition. The second is on social innovation and just transition. And the third was on empowering and engaging vulnerable groups for the just transition. And as you can see, we have different topics coming up as well in the future. And in a week after this email, when you receive access to the module, you'll also have access um, to registration for the various different topics coming up. So in this particular webinar, we're going to be exploring the critical role of grassroots initiatives and community learning in fostering a just transition, starting at the roots as we see with the wild olive tree roots painting by Sargent. Our journey begins with a definition um, of what the grassroots initiatives are, and we'll have a look at that now. Starting with community learning, um, the community learning is defined as a process that enriches the lives of individuals and groups by engaging them in a range of voluntary learning action and reflecting opportunities. Community learning aims to build proactive support for alternative futures from the bottom up, working towards shared agendas for solidarity and social justice. A grassroots initiatives are community driven efforts aimed at creating social, political or environmental changes from the bottom up. If we're going to be looking at particularly inspiring or idealistic version of what a grassroots movement um, can be seen as, we can say that it could be campaigns that mobilize individuals to take action and influence outcomes, often with a political focus. And we'll see that also with um, some of our speakers, I think. These efforts seek to harness the collective power of communities to bring about change, disrupt established structures, and advocate for reforms that align with the community's needs and aspirations. There are a number of challenges um, and hopefully the webinar will present some opportunities for grassroots and community uh, learning for the just transition. And it's really important that we understand what these challenges are so that we can develop certain strategies in order to overcome them. And by doing this, we can hopefully leverage opportunities and help communities achieve meaningful and sustainable change. Um, some type of different effective strategies to address common challenges, um, which are implicit in these in these uh, different strategies, um, include, for example, strengthening organizational structures. We can strengthen uh, organizational structures in order to develop robust organizational frameworks that can help sustain engagement and prevent burnout of individuals and of efforts. Um, also, by building strategic partnerships, we can collaborate with other organizations, other nonprofits and governmental bodies that can hopefully help provide additional resources and also amplify impact. 
Another strategy could be fostering inclusive dialogue, including open dialogue with the community to help manage different perspectives and build consensus. Because of course, if the community agrees with what you're doing, hopefully you have a little bit more impact there. And then of course, funding is a topic that will always be a challenge for various uh, grassroots and community-driven initiatives. Um, but of course, with looking at different funding sources, grants, crowdfunding, and local business partnerships, perhaps some of these financial constraints can be alleviated. We, uh, in the Just for All project, which um, I will is coordinated by the Solidar Network in Brussels um, and EAEA, ourselves, the European Association for the Education of Adults, our partners in it, have also come out uh, with a variety of successful Just Transition initiatives, which are available on the Solidar page for the project, which my colleague will place in the link and the chat. Um, here are lots of examples of how community-driven and uh, grassroots initiatives can work, but not only, also all of the other thematic uh, modules that we cover in this MOOC. Good examples from European, global, and local um, contexts, including Cyprus, Ireland, France, and Sweden, um, can be looked at by theme, and that's out, so you're more than welcome to have a look after the webinar. And most importantly, <laughs> you know, this very large QR code can lead you to, but also the, the link that will be shared with you both after and now hopefully in the chat um, will help you get a full picture of the resources by looking at our MOOC. As I've mentioned, at the end of this week, you should get access to the fourth module and the fourth MOOC on grassroots initiatives and community learning. And then as you can see, um, there's only four more modules uh, afterwards. So you're more than welcome to join us uh, to get inspired gain a badge um, and see and give your opinion too. That hopefully sums up the most speaking I'll have to do in a row because I'm all very excited by the speakers that we have with us today. Uh, we have with us Sigrid Nima, who is um, based in Berlin currently, um, if I've understood, uh, who is the one of the founding members of the International Culture Centre from Uwe Fabrik. Um, then we also have with us Mikhail Tokdemir, who is from uh, Norman or is based in Normandy in France, uh, who is the director of the Maison de l'Europe. Um, and then we also have with us Jana Ahlers, who is the head of education and learning at European Alternatives, also based, I think, today in Berlin. I'll let them introduce themselves uh, with uh, a little bit more in detail um, and get started with the conversation. This uh, webinar has been prepared by also my colleague Angeliki Yanakopoulou, who could not be with us today. But uh, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to contact uh, her as she is the contact point for the Just for All project. Perfect. So perhaps then what I will do is I will uh, spotlight our uh, speakers one by one, and then I will ask them to introduce themselves and their organizations. So let's do that. I think I can spotlight many. Perfect. There we are. Hopefully we can. There we are. Lovely. Okay, so perhaps then I will start uh, by passing the floor to uh, Jana and asking you to uh, introduce yourself and your work at European Alternatives. Yeah, a pleasure. Um, welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jana Alice. I'm the, currently the head of learning and education at European Alternatives. It's a transnational European organization that's based in several places currently, mostly focusing on Germany, Spain, Italy and France, and uh, sort of the overall mission is to demand, um, imagine, demand and enact equality democracy beyond the nation states, very much focused on the idea that the demands that we have for a just future need to happen beyond the nation state itself. And how we do that, uh, to make it more specific, we work in like different, uh, what we call streams. So we work, for example, on the Imagine stream, where we try to produce narratives and uh, basically broaden the imagination of people on what's possible beyond the nation state. And then we do research, we work with universities and other like thinking partners on basically implementing um, yeah, new research findings into practice. Um, we also do assemblies, um, not only in types of citizens' assemblies, people's assemblies, but also believe that assembling citizens and people from the grassroots and also civil society is a crucial point in making democratic change. And finally, um, we do ACT, 
So we have a, a stream that focuses particularly on implementation of action um, on a very variety of topics. And the final one is train. This is what I'm representing here today, where we basically try to implement learning and training across the work we do and run a variety of mostly grassroots based training um, across Europe um, for the past 17 years. Maybe that for now for the organization. Perfect. Um, and then I think, uh, yeah, later on, I'll have follow up. So we'll do it like that. So perfect. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. And then perhaps you could, I could ask you to do the same, please. Yeah, hello <clears throat> from my side. And thank you for having me here. My name is Sigrid Nima. And I'm one of the founding members of the International Cultural Center Ufa Fabrik that is based in Berlin. And uh, this center exists now since about 45 years. So we never named ourselves a grassroots initiative, but from your definition, I would say we would have been one. <laughs> and <clears throat> okay, uh, so I can talk a lot about our processes and development and also the challenges. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, hopefully, and you know, the definition that the, that we've chosen is really quite all encompassing as well. So um, it's nice to see that you identified yourself in that. Great. Um, and Michael, could you introduce yourself and a little bit um, the uh, Maison de l'Europe? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Togdemir. So I'm the director of uh, Maison de l'Europe. Um, so Maison de l'Europe is an association who, which we talk about about but European Union, and we try to have a link between uh, territories and citizens uh, uh, and European institutions. So um, since 2009, we uh, have the Europe Direct label. Um, it's a give by, uh, by European Commission. And since 2021, we are an official office of a European institution in Normandy um, with some different missions uh, for uh, to um, to inform uh, every everyone about the European Union and European election so i will give you in the chat some links to to see uh, every uh, every project uh, so we are 30 we are 49 in France in Europe direct France and more than 400 in European Union. So you can check in the link uh, if you want. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, okay. Well, after, let's have a little uh, deep dive in. We're going to have to go straight in, I think, to make the use of everyone's time. Um, so if we're turning to Jana again, um, I know that the European Alternatives is emphasizing a lot of um, political activation of grassroots, uh, different initiatives, recognizing sustainability as a political claim. And I know you were also talking about the, the transnational needs, desire, and, and also importance there. Um, how do you see this influencing broader political narratives and what strategies have been effective in ensuring that the grassroots uh, voices remain central to these discussions? Very complex question. Let me start a bit uh, smaller. So I think um, to make it a bit more concrete, so I think um, how, why do we activate people? I think we, we really believe centrally, I think since the beginning of the, the founding again in 2007 of the organization that um, is crucial to have more support and like building a new imaginary of Europe and um, for that it is, it is very essential to produce these new narratives and how we produce these narratives is I think a bit similar to the things I've mentioned before I think it, it can be in very direct trainings where we educate people on advocacy on a range of skills countering repression of the state on um, how to express your opinions on different levels of governance that can also be in assemblies um, such as the people's assemblies or the systems assemblies formats um, but it can also be in more imaginary or cultural moments, because I think we very much believe that um, cultural occasions can be moments of political self-efficacy and empowerment, um, because um, yeah, they bring people together in new ways and then they open a place for new imaginaries. So that's, I think, another method that we've claimed fairly effective. When it comes to sort of our work on the just transition itself, um, I think for us, um, I guess, intersectionality as a topic or simply the... The connections of different crises is very clear so i think we very much focus on the planet, planetary crisis in itself i think which links like sustainability questions but also 
any questions of social justice and equality. So, um, and how maybe some of the strategies um, that I think we claim as effective on this topic um, are, I think the key, I think the key to success or the key to winning, if you want to say it like that, is to have a multiplicity of approaches um, and don't only rely on, for example, advocacy, but also include, for example, lobbying, which includes having people in the inside. This is like in municipal, local, regional governance authorities or also in economic positions of um, power and decision making. But um, obviously another focus, which I think should happen at the same time, is the focus on the ground. So grassroots involvement, social movements, activism that can build power from below, influence narratives, influence media, and therefore also sort of influence the wider picture. And maybe to mention two other elements I think we focus on is very much, I think, the idea of advising. I think if... I think this classic question is if people are trying to produce a new world, but there's nobody ha has written a blueprint, then they will look for one. And if you're early on redefining the blueprint, um, then you can, I think, have a tremendous influence um, on there. And I think the final one would be advising. So I think that the question of, yeah, how do you position yourselves in terms of in the research spectrum, in the advocacy spectrum, but also in the in the simple relational spectrum between people and advising small scale to large scale decision making. So, um, yeah, I think overall, um, I guess, I think our I think our sort of key to strategies in terms of narrative influence from the grassroots side is to be conscious of the complexity of how change happens and be present at all levels, if possible, and act as the, the connector, the catalyst or the translator, so to say, between the different levels. And that's very much the work we do. And um, but I think still, of course, of the heart in the grassroots level, because we do believe that um, in some way the, the people should also have the main say in what the future looks like. And that's uh, really interesting. You've mentioned uh, a lot of things that actually will work in collaboration uh, with uh, Maison de l'Europe, for example, how you're working with people from different approaches, from the municipalities, from different uh, levels of, of power, as you put it, economic power as well, and, and social power. Um, and also this idea of um, a multiplicity of approaches, um, which is, I think, really, really key when you're looking at the just transition as a from a holistic approach. Um, and, and then maybe I'll just pass to Zigrid then and I'll ask um, that I know that in uh, Ufa Fabric you also really look at the just transition um, from an intersectional process. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe you could uh, let us know how it is that you also uh, act with this um, multiplicity lens and for you how that sort of includes and leads to an equitable transition. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> So imagine uh, 45 years ago, the world was very different and there was no uh, internet existing. We had no mobile phones, you know, it was completely another world, I would say. And so also from the background, when we started, we really started by ourselves. So it was something that we said, we want to change our life or create life conditions that, um, uh, we feel they are, yes, uh, they, they will create a quality of life we would like to have and to live. So we started by ourselves. <clears throat> and um, it was really pioneering in many fields. Uh, our um, vision was to create um, yeah, a work and life project where we could um, work in a, yeah in conditions we created by ourselves. We felt it made sense to work in this field. And also we wanted to create a community life, not to live in a little family like father, mother, and one or two children, but uh, to work in a bigger context. And this is all situated in the former West Berlin, uh, so in the Western part. <clears throat> and so far we stick to our vision until today. We work mainly in three uh, directions. One is <clears throat> ecology or sustainable, like sustainability, like we say today. The second was arts and culture. And the third was uh, um, community or 
social experiment. And all our activities uh, we wanted to link to each other. So that's really, it's a kind of holistic project. And we feel this is a direction like people used to live <laughs> and they should live in the future. So um, we are very practical orientated. We have a day-to-day -day life. <clears throat> we live here on the grounds uh, with about 35 people since beginning. And all people who are able to work, work in the different areas of our activities. Um, we uh, all in all, it's about 200 people working in the Ufa Fabrik. We have an um, area of 16,500 square meters and seven houses with, where all those difficult, uh, different activities happen. That's um, more or less the framework. <clears throat> and it's about 200,000 people from the neighborhood and the city of Berlin and tourists as well that come here in a year to join one or another activity. So maybe you should ask me questions so that I don't go too far. <laughs> Perfect. Actually, I was just um, hearing about uh, this this idea that you have uh, about 200 people who are living together or somehow physically. No, you have 35 people living on the ground. Living and 200 working. Mm -hmm. Working, okay. Um, You know, the, and then you say you have 200,000 people who are coming as tourists and as visitors. How is it that you can stop, um, you can ensure that it's not just a sort of people who are really engaged in a small enclave, but how can you really ensure that you're expanding your reach to engage those 200,000 people? How, how do you do it? What is your, mm -hmm. your approach? Okay, so you could say um, we are kind of service orientated. <laughs> So we we organize uh, cultural events. Um, we have programs for leisure classes, like workshops, uh, like we have a circus school, we have um, uh, dance and music classes, but we also have a neighborhood center where people come and um, with a focus on small small children and families, you know, where people can meet and gather and get advice. And we have this concept of self-help groups that means if if you have a certain interest you can come here and for very little money we can offer a room a space and also um, maybe support how to create such a group and then people with a special interest they can meet here in a, a weekly or whatever um, um, yeah rhythm like they want um, we have a free school here for children and I must say these 200,000 people, that's um, a statistic number. That means people who come here every day, they are counted every day. So just <laughs> maybe to make it a, a realistic picture. And yeah, so we have a cafe in the center of our um, area where people can just come and have lunch or meet friends or whatever. So we have a children's farm where people can come and feed rabbits and chicken and ride ponies and things like that. And it's also an open offer for children from the neighborhood. Um, they can help out here and we support them with um, with food and um, um, pancakes from the eggs from the chicken. <laughs> You see, so we work in a very, very uh, peer-to-peer situation, but also on a big scale. Like we have international festivals, international corporations. Um, we are linked to several networks, like maybe the network Transeuropal, you might know, th dot net. Um, I, I cannot put something in the chat, but maybe you can do it, uh, where we are linked to European other cultural centers who... Uh, work in a similar, um, yeah, similar direction. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of like community learning that's at the backbone of your service oriented approach or somehow some level of community gathering. Um, and I will ask you more questions on that. But first, I would like to just pass the floor to um, Michael, because I also know that in uh, uh, Maison de l'Europe that, you know, there's also some level of uh, community engagement, of course, and community learning. So how does that play out um, in Maison de l'Europe? And how do you think that that helps push forward the goals um, of the Just Transition? Uh, yeah, we we work a lot with the com local communities. So, um, in the beginning, it was really hard and difficult to manage and to find some people to work with us uh, because Europe is is far away and uh, and people don't want to work uh, about um, um, things they don't like. So it's 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 a little bit complicated, but. We try to have an, an approach uh, with um, sometimes with uh, uh, with games or activities or different things to, to create some uh, events and they uh, people will uh, we just uh, uh, do uh, an activity and we we uh, talk with them about the European Union or uh, Green Deal. So, uh, because it's the it's one of the priority of the European Union, and it's because of that we talk about just transition. And um, so we have so many partners in this in our territory. So we just call them and we try to create some uh, big activities with them. Um, I have uh, two examples to share with you. Uh, one of them is we try to create. Um, a radio show with um, with people. So um, I just asked to a journalist, radio journalist, if uh, he wants to to create um, a workshop with people. And um, I asked to um, a social center and or young centers or uh, local communities. Uh, uh, center for uh, for um, disabled people or i don't know um they have people in their structures i don't uh, search people they have just in their uh, establishment they have some people and uh, i just i just try to have a link between this journalist and these people and we will do a workshop with them to talk about how we can create a radio show together. After that, we try to have some questions about uh, just transition, etc. And after we just find some um, people who work in these uh, activities, so uh, agriculture area, uh, how uh, they can use um, AI in uh, just transition, etc., etc. And after that, people. Uh, we just um, do the show in real uh, moments in uh, in live, and after that we have some podcasts and and programs with them. So with the radio show, we just have some uh, exciting project with people, and they was like, okay, it's not just we we learn something, we will do something together, and we will create something together. So we will uh, engage uh, ourselves in this project. This is first of all, and the second project, it's with um, uh, with a media influencer, food influencer in Instagram. So she did uh, MasterChef in France. So she was a, a known people and just asked to her to create a food workshop about uh, how we can use food uh, in our life and uh, and how we can use everything in the food without trash and uh, in the sustainable way. So she created the workshop and uh, when people uh, knew, uh, uh, heard uh, uh, her name, uh, I just uh, asked to different group of uh, social center, etc. and schools and they was like, okay, we know her so we can come to do something with her. We want to do something with her. And in this uh, project, I can uh, just give my message, just give my Green Deal uh, uh, message to, to everyone. So I try to 
really work with uh, people who they have influence or with local authorities who can just uh, um, send the mail to some people or try to have more people than just my organization. I wish that we all had uh, Instagram influencers in our back pocket <laughs> ready to help us with our cause. But uh, I imagine it was also a lot of work to get to that point yes. <laughs> <laughs> as well. Um, and something I had like... the chance because she lived in my uh, town. So I was like, okay, I can just go to see her and try to, to, to ask her. And she was like, okay, I have the same values of you and I want to work with you. And she don't ask money. So maybe everyone can do it if, <laughs> if they try. Yeah, of course. Of course, funding is, is always an issue. So if we yes. have a, this offer, it would be great. Um, and what, what I'm noticing about these kind of initiatives is that they're very uh, accessible to the public, right? That's your mm. idea is that they want to get involved. Um, but you also started by saying that, you know, the, one of the challenges you face is that Europe is far away mm. uh, for a lot of people. So I'm wondering um, when it comes to marginalized people in society or people who, let's say, would not stumble into a community center because they have this strong urge to to learn how is it that you go about trying to engage them um when it comes to talking about the european goal of of, of the just transition mm. from this angle um I, I don't use complicated thing i just use the values of european union and uh, my uh, since i i'm in the i'm the director of maison de l'europe we go uh, to see people we don't wait to have people in our office we go to the marketplace, we go to uh, uh, different uh, uh, festivals, to uh, different action places. And uh, maybe uh, some some festivals, there was like, why you have a stand in, in this festival? You are just European. And I was like, it's okay. Just I want to have some public. So I go and I just have a discussion with people. And with that, I can just manage uh, every everyone. I go to see people and it's uh, it's worked like that uh, in in my area mm. That's a, that's a very uh, interesting and, and hands-on approach. And so then maybe I pass to Jana, because I, I know that obviously this uh, European level is is very important as well for you. You said you wanted to build a different vision of, of Europe and, and such like. But of course, there's a lot of challenges that we're facing right now in the EU, including this extreme rise of far right of politicians and such like. So in this sort of landscape where it's becoming uh, substantially perhaps less attractive Europe, perhaps you could say that the EU, how do you tackle that um, with the work that you're doing and yet continue to push forward this very human need, which is to have a just transition? Uh, well, it's certainly not becoming any easier these days. <laughs> um, I do think, I think if we go back to the core values of like what our work stands for, I think the importance is to like bring these values and I think these opinions to the people. So I think it's less about the abstract idea of Europe as a concept and more about the question of like, what does solidarity mean to you? What does justice mean to you? Like, you know, what does work mean to you? And I think like in some of the work programs that we do, I think also to make it a bit more concrete than the other, like the other ones, um, I think, for example, one work program focuses on basically ecologizing demands for workplace struggle. So it's quite concrete. So I think, for example, to make it very specific, like we work with workers that work at Ryanair, the airline, or for example, work in platform work delivering food. I'm sure you have ordered like a um, bike delivery food before. And the question is, obviously it's not about canceling these people's jobs because these jobs are obviously entirely precarious and are across Europe and every country are suffering um, from like really bad work conditions and as well as being carried out by mostly migrant workers. So I think there the question of Europe comes very easily back into not only the, the worker, but also the consumer of that, the food into what kind of, um, yeah, what's the future of Europe in terms of justice and the, and the workplace. And I think there, what we do is I think we connect in this case, the people that work in this field across Europe, because the struggle is very similar. And um, we have a very strong focus on migrant justice in our work and like the working with the needs of uh, communities. And I think similar to what Mikael said, I think we also work very much with going to community places, going to like meeting spots, but also working with like um, um, community groups that are politically organized. So that have some kind of ambition to br bring forward their own political demands. And when it comes to the just transition there, I think there the crucial aspect comes, I think, again, and again, that it's not about 
canceling all jobs at Ryanair, right? It's not that's not the suggestion. The suggestion is for it to be just is that we need to think about who's like who are the profiteers and who are the people suffering from the consequences of the ecological crisis? And these are not the precarious migrant workers at Ryanair or the platform jobs, but these are the companies. And I think it's very much about demanding. Um, I think in this case, for example, supporting um, those groups that are not in unions in this case and supporting them with like demands that work, um, that yeah, expect include the just, um, just aspect and the transition aspect. And maybe one other example would be like we work with like more established migrant advocates at the European level from different countries who are positioned in some in some way on municipal level, for example, already. And we support them to build networks and alliances across Europe because again, they're advocating for their cause and they have shared interest. So I think it's very much always again about the empowerment, while at the same time also realizing that actually these voices are the voices that need to be heard. Um, in the public discourse. Definitely. So this idea of uh, enhancing the voice of, of citizens and making sure that, okay, we're not uh, we're not just working on, on this vague concept, but really concretizing it. Um, and then maybe I uh, wonder, you talked about unions and, and, or no, companies without unions or the role of companies. Do you have any uh, successful examples of where, um, I mean, you've, able to help a company truly, I mean, affect and and work towards a just transition in the sense of, I know you cited Ryanair and I, I'm sure you've done work with them, but there are, you know, I don't know if you find it frustrating or not, but there are times when you think, is this enough? Is this what the future really is going to be? Is this how we're going to get there? Perhaps, perhaps I'm projecting here. So I'm just wondering if you have any other examples or how you perhaps, if not navigate with the idea that there will never be a way to get to a perfect just transition with with one company i mean of course the reiner example was just a very um small example from the work we do i think generally we we work also very closely with social movements or like civil society organizations that you know work on this topic like for me personally i used to work for the the counter conference the un climate change summits which happens every happen every year and it's like an accumulation of um groups that fight for this and I think yes of course I think there's a, a certain level of idealism you need but I think also we see yeah we see change I think uh, I was just talking to someone this morning about this that as an example I think currently I think South Africa is a great example for the just transition that's happening there or in Vietnam there's um, now challenges in the just transition partnerships I think there's institutional examples but I think the reason they are criticized the reason that they have improved is because of grassroots pressure and it's because of grassroots engagement and I think in this I guess European but also international focus we try to always highlight not only what's going wrong but also highlight the great examples I think just one tiny example maybe some of you know this example of like a just transition is in Italy where workers have occupied a factory close to Firenze it's a car factory and they have themselves proposed a transition plan of transforming this car factory into a place that manufactures um, uh, solar panels and cargo bikes. It's just one example and it's been a two, a two and a half year ongoing process. And I think it's just really important to highlight those examples of success and the imagination again to, I think, not stop the fight. Because I think, yeah, we are confronted with very large actors and I think we need people to also have winnable and hopeful uh, solutions on the way there. And, you know, also, even though we are not, uh, well, we're a, a non-profit organization, we work very much onto this idea of, of democracy and social engagement and such like ourselves at EAEA. And one of the things we like to engage in is sort of um, creating visions for the future or somehow this stream imagining. Um, but it's all the more complicated, the more number of people you have uh, in, in an organization, in a community. I mean, or this is uh, or, or it's a potential risk, you know, to find consensus, for example, can be challenging. Um, and maybe I, I turn back to Zikud and I ask, you know, how is it that you've uh, co-built your values and your um, work life vision? How is it that that process of co-creation is happening um, in a concrete way? <laughs> Yeah, good question. So first of all, we are a non-profit organization, for sure. And uh, we have a very 
how we say, basic democratic system. That means our highest decision-making body inside the Ufa Fabrik, it's still the plenary of people living there. And uh, in this um, forum, we don't accept majorities. We really discuss until we come to, to the point. And uh, okay, I, you can imagine how much time this needs. <laughs> Uh, but okay, it's also a long-term process. That that means in the beginning we were discussing a lot and we were really um, struggling for decisions. Nowadays it's more relaxed in a way that in in the working areas we are we don't stick or we don't need these decisions. We only need it in the very crucial big decisions. And why did we do so until today? 45 years, imagine, <clears throat> because we know we cannot afford something else. We need this um, um, getting to yes with everyone, because when we are facing uh, big challenges, we have to stick together. And we don't want to be separated by 20 people said yes and 10 said no. And then there is an inside struggle. So we discussed before and then we go in one direction. But this is only the heart of the Ufa Fabrik. Um, it's not, they, it doesn't include all the 200 other people working with us. <clears throat> but in fact, you know, I always say it's a kind in our organization kind of DNA that we started from a certain vision that we would really would like to work collectively and we stick to that. So that means many processes, how we arrange them until today, it's always with this, um, how do you say, the spirit of collectivism. And so you can feel this um, when there are difficult situations. Now we are... Um, um, we are in the situation that there will be huge financial cuts in, in Berlin or in Germany. And you feel that now people really, they, they get together and they want the best. So there's a, there is solidarity, even if it's not easy. And because we are a non-profit organization, we are able to offer a lot of services uh, with a very low uh, ticket fee or entrance fee you know we we can <clears throat> offer lots of activities for free until now and or just for a little money this is very important for us because we open the doors for all neighbors we want to include everyone who's able to come here and yes so uh, we have um, an organization the neighborhood center it's quite a big organization <clears throat> and so now they got, I don't know the English word, a Betriebsrat. Maybe you can help me, Jana. Workers' Council. Yeah, a Workers' Council. Thank you. And this is a very new situation for us because we always thought we, we are going in a very social and uh, in a direction where we, we find the best um, the best opportunities for everyone to work with us. And now there's a formal instrument and <laughs> okay, we, we are trying to deal with this, but uh, it's, it's uh, in our case, um, it doesn't fit really, I would say. So it's also interesting how these more formalized structures that might work in bigger organizations in our organization, there is less flexibility. No? So, hello, ich bin hier noch beschäftigt. There's an interruption, sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, maybe I, I stop here or no worries. Um, question. Well, what I'm I'm wondering, I suppose it's a it's a joint question debate for uh, Michael, for Cyril, or for Jana, um, that you just mentioned, and there's something I was thinking about the difference in organizations here about the more formalized, perhaps larger, or somehow, uh, yeah formalized is perhaps the best word, organizations, and this uh, more loose. Uh, 
you could say community approach, what are the benefits and, and drawbacks for you on both approaches when it comes to approaching the, the just transition? And maybe to concretize that in a better question, I will turn to Michael and say, do you think that you're at an advantage or disadvantage coming from what I understand is a more formalized structure uh, with the Europe direct label, with this sort of mission from above almost coming more than um, than this community driven? How do you uh, see yourself when you're listening to the examples of Jana and Sigrid um, as your ability to to incite change in comparison to to a, a maybe more community approach. Mm. Um, when you with my organization, um, it was really hard to to have a name uh, for people to have, uh, when, when people, when I say Maison de l'Europe or Europe direct, uh, it was a hard work. It's, it's take really long time to, to have a name. Uh, and, um, when, uh, people see your activities, see how you try to help everyone, how to try to have in your personal work area, some sustainable, practice or um, or just to have just transition activities um, they have some trust to you uh, and uh, and they can just uh, they know now they know uh, they can just uh, come to see me and uh, I will be happy to do something with them so I the first thing I try to create a name uh, and I try just to present myself uh, in every uh, people, in every structure, uh, local authorities and uh, schools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. After that, um, when just they have a trust, uh, we can do something together, and um, they know they can have an advantage from me because I'm linked to a European institution, uh, maybe. I can find funds, uh, and I know I can have some advantages from them because I will have a public. Uh, I will have uh, uh, people who can hear what I want to uh, tell them. So, um, so and and it's really important to me to create some activities, um, not in my side, but with everyone, uh, and the group and the community level it's really important because we have um, a more strength to do something together so uh, when i started i i just create some some little thing in my area with with uh, my team we are just me and one salary so it's really difficult to do something and now with uh, volunteers with um, uh different people with groups strengths uh, we can do more uh activities and we can have more impacts for for people so uh, it's really complicated to manage this and to 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 um have some concrete thing in the beginning but we don't i don't uh let them go i just have Okay, if you want to do something with them, try to be uh, creative and try to be uh, try to have a, a impact with them and try to uh, um, just create some um, really uh, pleasant area, nice area for everyone, uh, and just uh, people are really happy to be here. Uh, the project is good, but the first thing is. They need to be happy to be here, and uh, it's the big advantage for everyone to to create something because we are happy to do something together. I think I try to try to respond to your question, but <laughs> well, maybe I was going to pass it to to mm -hmm. and, and to Jana what they mm -hmm. think of, of formalized versus less formalized structures. Hearing also Michael's uh, a response in terms of the impact uh, that you can have on the just transition and communities. Either of you can speak if you'd like. If neither of you would like to speak, I can also move on. Me or uh, Jana and Sigrid? Jana and Sigrid? 
happy to say, share something. I think, um, I mean, I think it's a bit of the um, simple answer to say both, but I think, um, I think this question, what Mikael was talking about, the reputation and the embeddedness and the relational work that happens in the community is crucial for impact. But again, I think it's also great to have foot in the other door. You know, I think that's what I think. I think in a way, our theory of change is very much. I think, for example, like um, to name a concrete example, like what we do is we support like migrant organizations locally in like a long term strategy process, um, organizations that include people from workers rights to like um, people that are, as an example, supporting non-white refugees from Ukraine that are living in Germany now that have don't have the rights of white refugees, for example, and support them. So I think it, we support them stra strategically, um, which is a very like a, a more service oriented or more like accompaniment process. But at the same time, also, we try to see every single opening at a local meeting to speak on the topic or we try to organize town halls or we try to connect with um, other places in Europe where advocacy can happen and try to find out where the access points are, where we could bring something in an advising capacity or in a lobbying capacity into decision makers realms. So I think, yeah, in that terms, I agree. Um, and I think adult education, in my opinion, or adult learning, sorry, this is a new framing. This is a great narrative change, but for example, <laughs> to adult learning and education um, is often not seen as political enough. I think there is a lot of potential and I think often it ends at the doing it for the sake of doing it, but I think there's a lot of potential in, in it and in also changing the political agency of citizens and non-citizens to become agents of their life. And I think, yeah, that's where I see our role, I guess. Your uh, your, your last thought about the, the political um, nature of adult learning and education uh, could have come right out of our training from the ABC of L in, in uh, October. This is exactly what we were trying to share with our participants too, this idea that, of course, you you learn, you become critically aware. By becoming critically aware, you can become engaged in society and or more engaged or not depending on your own understanding of the world around you. And that's uh, that's something that's, that's uh, really nice. Um, uh, and I then maybe want to ask, uh, I guess what I was looking for before um, <laughs> to, to take a negative approach, because I think it's always interesting to hear, what are the challenges um, that you are facing uh, in terms of uh, adults uh, learning and education for the Just Transition in terms of community engagement? Um, we mentioned, I've heard funding, time being an issue. What are your biggest challenges uh, right now and what are uh, your ways to mitigate them? Perhaps, uh, Zikrid, I see you're not on mute, so you're more than welcome to, uh, <laughs> to answer the question. Yes, I'm still uh, I'm still uh, thinking about uh, the question before. Perfect. Um, so uh, when I think uh, in our case, you know, this easy access is very important. And when we speak about people coming to, to Germany, of course, there are a lot of structures how they can apply for money or for for living space or whatever, but they need advice because it's so complicated. Even if you have your translation program in, in, in your mobile, uh, you need advice. And this is what we offer in our neighborhood center. So you have both, you know, the, you have the structures, but you also have volunteering people um, uh, also elderly people that help out. And I think it's always the combination. Um, so uh, this is why I spoke about those self-help groups, you know, that people, when they have a certain interest, like, okay, your husband died shortly and, and you need people to, 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 to communicate about that fact. So you, you can come here and you start an initiative and it can grow. So recently, you know, I had been to Helsinki to a conference and I learned about a project that is called Creative Aging. Uh, it's also a EU project um, between Great Britain, <laughs> Great Britain uh, <laughs> and um, Finland. So, and the, the first approach was to bring uh, arts and creati creativity to older people so that they can enjoy their life more. So, and when I heard this, you know, uh, I have a completely different view. Uh, I think 
It's also about life conditions of artists, of people living in the artistic and cultural world. So when they come in this age uh, where other people might get retired, you know, they have very often very low uh, financial backgrounds. And <clears throat> so now there is a kind of initiative or movement starting on this topic. And... Uh, maybe one day, you know, when you know the circle, how organizations start or how they develop or, um, you know, you need this this wide approach until you can start to build a structure. And so I think it's very important that we have these possibilities also, like Mikaelo uh, explained to us, you know, that people have a starting point to Yes, to go for their own interests. And we have to, um, yeah, to, to build the ground that people uh, find their possibilities to, to, to start to be active and uh, to be included. Mm. And you, you mentioned a, a good example of a, of a project. Um, we also at EE have done projects on, on aging, of course, and, and active aging and all these different terms. But um, I'm wondering if you see a difference now in different generations and their interest in being engaged in community work. I mean, in terms of uh, all of your organizations maybe are engaging either, I'm imagining, interns or volunteers or presumably younger people, but also, of course, trying to reach out to older people too. Is there is there something that you're noticing, difference, their willingness to engage in community work, their understanding of the just transition as well? Perhaps, uh, Zikre, do you... Uh, could could uh, answer back and then sure I think uh, it would be another webinar <laughs> of course it's about life conditions and um, what I see when I look um, the generations that come after me to say it like that uh, you know it's very hard to 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 to, to find your place in life to build up a good uh, solid um, financial background that you can raise a family and you know so at a certain time in your life you are so busy to build your own structure your own small little family structure or whatever structure and maybe before and after you are more open to to voluntary work or to other developments in societies i would say in general so Yeah, of course, we're, there's, it's, as you say, it's linked to our, our work life condition and what mental space I think we also have to allocate to, to certain issues, I think, or, or what, what place it takes. Uh, what do you think, both uh, uh, Michael and Jana, do you have any strong reactions to, to what you see in the difference of generations and uh, their approach um, to this issue? Maybe I can go quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a huge, I think there's this, this um, sort of subscription to the younger generation to be the active generation, but I think it's actually a bit flawed, unfortunately. I think actually it's a big challenge to include um, the younger generation. And I think, I mean, there's an opportunity for grassroots learning because people are looking for purpose, they're looking for community. And I think those two things are not as easily to get these days as maybe back in the day. And I, in terms of like the, I think, intergenerational learning is one of the potentials of like more sustainable impact within this field it is just very challenging i think because you lose people obviously often in the time of children or the time of like intense work and then people return when they're retiring but i think and to pour like good men mentorship and also keeping resilience within an organization's context i think you also need this generation so i think in some way groups that have like you know, in movement like in social movement theory you would call this elders as like a term people that you can refer to for reference i think it can be really powerful and incredibly um yeah it can lead to much higher impact i just do think the challenge is the middle generation let's say in my experience yeah that's uh i, I can definitely see that also from life experience uh, happening um, and what do you think Michael is that the same uh... um, I just observe an, a little gap with uh, with uh, young generation and older generation about some um, just transition about just 
transition uh, activities. Um, when um, we have some Fridays for Future, when it was really a big event for everyone in Europe, uh, we have so much young people uh, and, and youngsters with us to do something and they are really motivated. And we have some more older people are just like, they just um, see that like, uh, what what is going on here? <laughs> it's it's complicated to understand why young people are so in uh, in activism and so uh, in the streets. So I, I just observe that. But since um, I don't know, since the the last election, I I just see some youngs that are disabused. I think we can I can say that uh, they just uh, lose some dreams or. The, the 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 trust of the policies so i i can i can see that since the the last uh, big european election so maybe it's 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 the same in european union but in france it's really difficult to to have some hope for for people uh, so the french government situation is different because uh, we have some so many crises but but you can see that, and it's really complicated to say to youngsters, so don't uh, let this go. Try to uh, connect with other with, with values and try to have a, a trust in, in the future. But uh, I can see that uh, in, in my activities now. Very interesting. Um... Of course, and I, as we were discussing that there's a role here for lifelong learning, adult learning and education, but also really engagement from all ages of learning um, to, uh, to for people to be involved, to be knowledgeable about, to feel empowered about the decisions they make and the values that they choose to align themselves uh, with. I think that um, I'm going to ask you all if you have questions for one another. If there's anything that you would like to know about one another's practices with two people based in Berlin, one based in France, with very sort of different structures and, and perhaps histories, um, if you have any questions or just comments on, on one another, um, and then uh, I will open it up to the audience um, and, and close it down. So any questions or comments from one another? I just see one question about uh, how hope the government policies help in Europe and encourage indigenous knowledge and practice from just transition. So uh, I don't know for every government in Europe, but in European Union, um, they sign, every government signed to Green Deal and you can just see every uh, package of Green Deal. Uh, it's not just um, for the sustainable change, it's really in the change, uh, change of society. So you can just see it in uh, in the European Commission website, maybe. Uh, and um, the European Union try to help with funds uh, to, to have some activities, learning activities. And I'm in Marseille now. Uh, normally, I'm in Normandy. Uh, because of uh, Erasmus Plus Conference, annual Erasmus Plus Conference with 15 countries, uh, in Marseille about um, uh, just transition, how Erasmus Plus can help about just transition. So uh, everyone here uh, in the future needs to do some project with uh, green uh, travel, uh, green uh, use of uh, digital skills, etc., etc. And so we can have, uh, we can create with European funds package and MOOC like you uh, for people to to try to have a, a just transition. So I, I try to respond to the question. <laughs> Maybe to add on to that response to the question, I think also the question is super interesting on the how can we encourage um, policies to be more driven by indigenous knowledge and practices. I think this is a really big topic and I think this is also again where like actually, grassroots groups come in very much because I think if you look at changes in policy in places where like um, indigenous knowledge has had more value, let's say an example of um, so-called Canada, um, then that tradition in policy was definitely driven by the grassroots and mostly 
by indigenous-led campaigns. So I think when it comes to implementing these these thoughts in the European context, I think we can look at um, yeah, again so-called global South countries and look at like community-driven examples that have existed long before and that have to, not to be reinvented by us, but rather um, yeah, I think have to be looked at and implemented in a more grounded way here. And I think it's a really important point um, in terms of implementing that. And then maybe on the generational question, I think as my own context is like having also a history of political activism myself in various places, I, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's it's not always only the question how people that have been politically active become empowered to become policymakers. I think there's also other roles to play. And I think it's important that there's not like a streamlined way because I think we need many positions um, to be filled by people that are critical thinkers and that are um, very much connected to their communities. And uh, yeah, so I think the, the policymaker is not the only um, ultimate goal. Yes, very, uh, very interesting. When you were mentioning before about, uh, or Mikhail, when he was mentioning about the Erasmus Plus and all of this, you know, of course, we believe in it. Of course, we use the tool. Of course, we we adhere to these, these values, but they, um, I think that, I mean, there can be a certain limitation to to um, how far you can go if you don't have the voice of the people and the voice of the community behind the the, the values, the decisions, and the actions. So that's something that you know I think we've seen a lot um, between the, between the three of you. Are there any last uh, comments or, or questions uh, from? Um, uh, sorry, but you know when i look at the german policy um the current situation i'm not very optimistic i must say so for so many years i was convinced we were we would go more and more in these uh, sustainable um, changes and on all levels you know uh, for me it was also very important to include arts and cultures uh, in in this uh, diversity concept and now when they say, okay, we have to save money, the first parts they 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 cut is arts and culture, it's um the green the, the green deal things, you know, the um and I wonder, you know, I wonder how it will go. So yes, I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> um but um at the moment I'm my illusions fade away, I would say, and we need a lot of power and a long breath, you know, again and again and again, um, show what is really important if we want, yeah, we want to go for quality of life for every one of us. Yeah, maybe to add on this um, note of um, potential desperation, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, obviously agree. I think um, in the lifetime of even my grandmother, she would say that this is the most difficult time that uh, she has been in, which I think is a big thing to say in your 90s now. Um, but I, I do think that I think in some way for this field, especially, it's also a moment to move closer together. And I think I'm happy that you're in Marseille. <laughs> yeah. Because I think, yeah, I don't think it's necessarily about convincing, let's say, the private sector that they should push on education learning. I think it's very much about remaining a strong, independent, external actor that can provide non-formal, informal, and formal adult learning as a value itself to a democracy. And I think, especially if things are being cut at the moment, it's very much, I think, setting up against that. Because I think what I am experiencing in funders meeting that I've been attending in Europe and Germany is very much that it's been sort of bought up by private, the private sector, the so-called education for democracy. But I think it's really crucial to stay outside and stay, I think, strongly rooted in the tradition of where this um, yeah, focus of education comes from, which is, again, yeah, from the direct contact of the people. So yeah, a bit of spark of hope, I think, um, in dark times, we should also yeah, work more closely together across countries. Yes, we, we need uh, really dark times, but our organization, uh, our power, um, our work, uh, it's really important now. And it's really, it will be, it will give some hopes to everyone. So um, we need to, 
work harder and harder i know <laughs> and um uh, so maybe um maybe the times will change i hope so <laughs> No, of course. And I think also when, when we're hearing um, and going back to, because I've perhaps let the conversation uh, go with the, with the interest, but um, going back to this idea of adult learning and its role in, in communities as well, that education, of course, has an incredibly strong role for, for democracy building. Um, and I think when you when we hear from the German context, this idea of building the, the education as this holistic approach, as this, um, this word doesn't really exist in French. I've tried before to, to find it. it. But, you know, it's <laughs> this idea of, of, of a holistic uh, approach to your well-being, to your critical spirit, uh, also in at one point towards your physical health as well. But I mean, coming, it's really has a has an all encompassing role um, for an individual's uh, critical and, um, and and mental uh, well being and understanding of the world. So that's also a potential um, a potential spark and hope uh, in the dark future. Then perhaps to end uh, on a um, I was going to ask a different question, but as we've come here, perhaps I should ask, what is your vision for um, what you would be li like to have? in terms of um, community engagement resources? I mean, to say, is it that you are looking for collaboration with new partners or funding resources or uh, spaces or participants? Um, for you, what would be an ideal vision uh, for what could, a wish, if you will, for how to better address the just transition from a community learning mm -hmm. perspective? Um, we'll ask everyone, but we can start with Mikhail as you're unmuted. Yes. Uh, just to, to remind you, I'm here because uh, thanks to uh, Ligue de l'Enseignement uh, in France, it's your partner, but it's our partner in every local area. They have uh, uh, um, some uh, local uh, um, organization, and I would like to thank them for that. And for me, uh, I will know you thanks to them. So the most important thing, and I, I think I, I said uh, it uh, uh, so much uh, in, in this webinar, is the partnership with every uh, structure. It's the biggest thing for me. The, when you have uh, a partnership, you can have uh, creative idea, ideas and um, different uh, resources and funds. Uh, I can come with European funds Ligue de l'enseignement can come with French authorities funds and French ideas. So when we link together, maybe the impact will be bigger and uh, the, the, the project will be uh, nicer. So, so it's, it's my opinion. Partnership is the, the, the big thing for me. Thank you very much. Um, and yourself, Jana? Yeah, I'm mean, linking onto that, I think, for to link on the partnership idea, I think for me, the partnership starts of like being embedded in some kind of community or organization. So I think the, the call to action is more or less to get organized or find a place of reference. And I think within that place of reference, then build partnerships. So seconding what Mikhail said, I think a part of that um, in terms of community engagement resources, I, um, yeah, I think it's sort of a, a call for people to make what they do available to others, which I think is not, not as, um, easy as it sounds, I think, and um, broaden the scope of their access to particular, I think, migrant communities, but also other communities that are usually not uh, accessing this uh, kind of material. And I think maybe finally, I think to um, politicize uh, the topic of the just transition or the green and just transition, if you want to say so, and make it like crucially relevant to like as um secret said quality of life but also yeah a democratic and just future and with that um sort of reclaim the educational space not only for the from the workplace or the the places of um transition or green jobs but into the hands of uh, so-called bildung or into the hands of um yeah education for the many Fantastic, thank you. And Sifid, would you like to be our, our last on the wish list? Yeah. Um, so I, I think I would end with a more philosophical view. I would say the most important is a freedom of expression for everyone. Um, that we come back in our societies to a respectful communication, that we stick to values, to tolerance, and 
uh, to this knowledge, especially for older and elderly people. Everyone is very special and everyone has uh, the right to, to be here and to express her and him or whatever self. <laughs> And that we don't lose that even if in times of financial crisis or whatever crisis. So that we, especially in adult education, you know, to learn how can I communicate in a way that um, I can express myself, but on the other hand, don't hurt someone else. And I would like to include that in every education for every teacher, for every social worker, for everyone who is working with community. Great. Well, thank you so much to all three of you. It's been really appreciated. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the conversation as much as I have. Um, of course, now you are in touch with one another. Feel free to do with that as you like. Um, I will be uh, sending uh, people who came, but also everyone who was on the Just for All um, registrations and MOOC webinar this recording. So thank you again for your time. Have a wonderful afternoon. And uh, we hope to be in touch to hear uh, more with what you're doing later in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>